Well, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here um, and I'm delighted to be talking about um, the research that I've been doing um, um, in the last sort of um, eight years and um, I'll be talking about the history and evolution of cyanobacteria. Um, Cyanobacteria are probably one of the most important organisms that have evolved in our planet. They have um, contributed to biological chemical cycles through Earth history, and they fundamentally transform the chemistry and the biology of our planet. Um, and this is because cyanobacteria were the first bacteria to um, evolve the ability to transform light energy into chemical energy and they do that um, by a process known as oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, they fix carbon dioxide, they use um, water as the electrode donor and they make carbohydrates or sugars and in fact um, as part of the reaction they release oxygen as the waste product. Now another thing that they're able to do um, is not all of them but quite a lot of them um, is that they are able to fix nitrogen. So they transform atmospheric nitrogen into bioavailable nitrogen. Um, nit atmospheric nitrogen is a very stable gas. There are sort of three um, bonds that are really hard to break. And I believe is the combination of um, these two metabolisms that enable cyanobacteria to make our planet habitable. Now, if we want to understand how cyanobacteria have contributed to biogeochemical cycles through Earth history, we need to understand you know, how uh, they have contributed to primary productivity and the biological pump. Here, I have a diagram showing um, how primary productivity has changed through geological time. In the, in the back, uh, we have, or to the right, we have past, we have present, to the left, and here are the geological time periods. In the last 500 million years, um, you know, it's much easier to sort of see how primary producers have changed through time, in part because some of them have a good um, you know, they fossilize well, like diatoms, cyanoflagellates, but this is much harder to understand when it comes to the early part of Earth history, um, and this is when cyanobacteria evolve. And part of the research and my interest is understanding sort of when cyanobacteria became important as primary producers in the ocean. So, you know, it, this is sort of some of the main questions um, that I've been interested in and, you know, a lot of that what I'm going to be talking about um, kind of goes back to sort of this, this introductory um, slide. Now, if we look at the sort of big picture and history of the Earth, um, the Earth is about sort of, you know, 4.5 billion years old um, and representing the age of the Earth with a circular diagram. So we have, this is past, going all the way to the present. And what we have is likely that for the first 600 million years, life was impossible in our planet. The, the Earth was too hot. We have the, you know, the heavy bombardment um, and we have evidence of life you know, at around sort of the 3.8 billion. It's likely that oxygenic photothrobes evolved very early on in the early Archean. Uh, but if you sort of think about the time in history, we have that the grade of the oxygenation event. So this is sort of the big kind of sort of chemical transformation of sort of evidence of oxidation uh, by cyanobacteria happening kind of nearly halfway through sort of 2.4, 2.3 billion years ago. And then animals evolve, you know, relatively late. We have, uh, you know, this is the Cambrian explosion, you know, evolving, you know, around sort of 530. Um, and cyanobacteria and their ancestors really dominated most of the Earth history. You know, we are definitely a recent event. Um, so, yeah, so, so that's kind of the big picture of, 
you know, these organisms have been around for quite a long time. Now, another interesting fact is that, you know, by 4 billion, we have the continents starting to form, oceans became, you know, started to accumulate. And by 2.5 billion, we have protocontinents with a very different configuration. But what we have is land and oceans. And, and this is important when it comes to the original cyanobacteria and how they diversified and started colonizing the earth. Um, when it comes to atmospheric composition, and I think this is sort of very well known, um, there was no uh, oxygen in the atmosphere and the atmospheric composition was very different. We had you know, higher concentration of CO2, we had methane. Uh, so the Earth was a very different um, planet back then. This is a sort of um, a representation, you know, by an artist of what the Earth would have looked like, you know, sort of very different to today. Um, you know, these are sort of stromatolites, but, you know, the thing to have in mind is that the composition and the chemistry of the oceans and the atmosphere was very, very different. Now, here I have a photograph of the Atacama Desert. Um, you know, this is an extreme environment, and it sort of reminds me of what the early Earth would have looked like. Um, this is, I have it here because, you know, we see, recently sequenced uh, a genome of Glycopsiopsis, um, but, you know, Basically, the early Earth was an extreme environment, and we have these cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are really good extremophiles. They're, they're pioneers. Um, they're ecological engineers. They, they do really well in these extreme environments. Um, and I sort of think about that when it comes to the early Earth. So the, these organisms, you know, basically what we have is they created what we have today, and our atmosphere has been really uh, the result of their biological activity and certainly you know the oxygen that has accumulated over earth history now so how do we know what's happened in in the past you know where is that information coming from so traditionally most of what we know about how you know nit the nutrient cycles have changed really comes from the geological record and what I represent in here is what happened in real life. So this is continents forming um, and you know volcanic explosions, all sorts of different things. But only a fraction of that gets recorded in the geological record, and that's what we use to reconstruct how oxygen levels change, how different the, the chemistry of the Earth, um, and will i use some of this information uh, most of my research really comes from the biological record or what i call as the genomic record and we have recorded our history in our genes um, and the sort of methods that i use to understand how cyanobacteria has changed through time is by constructing from the genomic uh, information that they have um, it's the, the tree of life of these organisms. Um, and interestingly, um, there are some parallels between the geological record and the biological record. The farther you go back in time, um, the rocks that we have available to infer things about the past, you know, are patchier, you know, the, the, that geological record becomes patchier. And similarly, you know, when it comes to sort of the tree of life, of um, we have that some of the earlier lineages and species would have gone extinct. Now, this is the information that I use in form with the geological record. Um, what I find really fascinating is we, through Earth history, the geology and biology have co-evolved with each other and geology has influenced biology and biology has evolved the geology and but then that has resulted in the biosphere that we now have. Briefly, what I'll do is I'll mention some of the methods that I use and, you know, a lot of the, what I'm going to be talking about um, is informed, you know, from sort of layers and layers of analysis. Um, 
So we do a lot of uh, genome sequencing and also uh, use publicly available data, um, use large genomic data sets or look at lots of different genes um, aligned sequences and, and protein sequences. And based on that information, we construct a phylogenetic trees and the tree of life of cyanobacteria. Once we have the phylogenetic tree, we use fossil data to calibrate a particular node, and then that allows me to know the age of a particular group. Um, so, so it's it, so that's a sort of um, set of analyses, and in some cases. Um, because I'm also interested in how traits have evolved through time. Um, I have been looking at sort of, um, there are also so different techniques, but most recently used a Bayesian approach, stochastic mapping. Um, and with that, we are able to sort of see um, what a particular ancestor um, could have done or what was the probability of a particular ancestor being of a particular trait. So in this case, for instance, we have a two traits, a binary trait, um, red and green, um, and then we can establish the, the posterior probability of this particular ancestor being either red or green. So, so that those are sort of set of analysis that is complemented with comparative genomics. In this case, we were looking at some the evolution of these phycobilisomes, and then we can sort of see, um, you know, the arrangement of the genes in the gene clusters. Um, and then I'm also interested in understanding, you know, the mode of evolution of some of these genes. So we look at single gel phylogenies um, determine whether you know things have evolved as the result of gene duplications, lateral gene transfer, has there been any losses of these genes and how they have distributed themselves across different species. So those are the sort of, you know, so there, from what I'm going to talk about, there are layers and layers of analysis. Now, traditionally, uh, we have, you know, what we know about the evolution of cyanobacteria comes from the fossil record. Um, and you probably would have sort of seen some of these fossils. Um, the Bill Schoff was a very, you know, has been a very prolific uh, paleontologist. Um, but interestingly, you know, at some point, um, he was talking about structures like these, you know, these are sort of apparently fossils from Australia of around 3.4 billion, uh, these, um, what he was sort of saying, there are some oscillatoria, filamental cyanobacteria, um, and claiming that, you know, we had fossils at this time. Um, work by Martin Bracer in, at Oxford have shown that, you know, these were not really fossils, but artifacts. Um, and really, you know, we get fossils that are truly cyanobacteria fossils much later on. Uh, as an, one example of that is the Gonflin chart at around 1.9 billion. Um, and these are evolving after the great oxygenation event. Uh, so um, anything prior to that, I would say uh, that is debatable, um, although this is not my field of expertise. Now, what I know is that the the, in terms of the fossil diversity of cyanobacteria that really flourish after the gray oxygenation event. Um, and, and that's it, right? Now, other methods that people have used to say date the origin of um, cyanobacteria are biomarkers. Um, the two methyl hopanoids is an example of this. Uh, these are lipids. They preserve well in the fossil record. Um, and be, you know, at some point um, they were used to date the origin of, of cyanobacteria. Um, and interestingly, there are some time periods in Earth history where these um, two methyl hopanoids increase in, in abundance, um, and this is being linked to cyanobacteria or nitrogen fixation. Interestingly, Paula Wallander from you know, right now, sort of based at Stanford University, uh, looked at um, 
the HPMP gene, which is involved in making the two methylhopanoids. Um, and what she was able to determine is that this HPMP gene is not um, uniquely found in cyanobacteria. So here, for instance, we have the HPMP gene here in red, and you can sort of see uh, cyan, you know, it's present in some of the cyanobacteria, but also found in alpha protobacteria. Now, what this is telling us is that we cannot really use um, these, these two methyl hopanoids as a proxy for cyanobacteria. And in fact, not only that, but it's, you know, it's been shown that some of these two methyl hopanoids from the Archean, in fact, are, you know, are the result of contamination. So where does that take us? It takes us to the, the, the great oxygenation um, that was, I uh, was talking about, the great oxygenation event is really probably the first evidence or reliable evidence of the origin of oxygenic photosynthesis happening sometime between 2.3, 2.4 billion years ago. Um, there is also some, you know, it's, it's already been shown that prior to this, there were some whiffs of oxygen uh, sometime, you know, um, prior to the great oxygenation event. Now, what happened around this time is that, you know, we have an, an increase in oxygen, um, but these would have been equivalent to sort of 1% of today's oxygen concentrations, and that is generous, probably was less than that. Um, and if you would have arrived on planet Earth at that time, you would have needed a spacesuit. It's really at the end of the Precambrian that we have um, that oxygen levels reach modern concentrations. And that is known as the Neoproterozoic oxygenation event. So this is happening between 800 and 600 million years ago. Um, these Two major transitions that have been well recorded with um, geochemical proxies, and there is vast literature on, on this. Um, my interest really has been, you know, looking at cyanobacteria, um, which is here, this oxygenic photosynthesis um, line, uh, and see if we see any sort of groups appearing, you know, is, is there any indication of these organisms contributing to these major transitions? Um, so that takes me to cyanobacteria. Um, and the origin of, of cyanobacteria is, is a bit more complicated than that because we have the origin of oxygenic photosynthesis and, and, and the sort of reaction centers. Um, and then we have the cyanobacteria that have left descendants, and that has been the focus of my research. Now, if we look at sort of cyanobacteria today, um, they're hugely diverse. We have filamentous forms, we have unicellular ones. Here, for instance, um, something quite unique to the bacterial groups is that cyanobacteria are able to produce differentiated cells. So this is a, a, in the nostocalis, these are heterocysts, they're specialized cells uh, where nitrogen fixation occurs. Um, and you know, this is another example here. And this is quite unique for, for bacteria. Some of them also form filaments. Uh, so they're not only diverse when it comes to morphology, but they also ecologically diverse. So you find them in glaciers, they also in um, drylands. Um, and here, for instance, I'm sort of showing um, a diagram where we indicated some of the genomes that we were studying. And you can sort of see that they're pretty much found all over the world um, in all sorts of different habitats. So um, now about uh, in, in 2013, um, somebody looked at um, use a phylogenomic approach to sort of see the closest relatives of cyanobacteria. And it turns out uh, that the closest relative of cyanobacteria are the melanobacteria. These names keep changing, by the way. So, you know, keep a lookout for that. Um, but here we have in green cyanobacteria, and it turns out 
um, that these uh, closest relatives of cyanobacteria are found some in groundwater soils um, and then some of them are also found in the gut or sort of intestines of, of their mammals um, and, and there's, they, they are symbionts. Some of them are able to synthesize vitamin B and K, um, but what is really here a key, the, the main message is that these organisms are non-photosynthetic um, and that, that is a really interesting question of like, why is it that these cyanobacteria, sort of closest relatives, have, have no ability to perform oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, so using this molecular clock technique, some of my research groups, this is my student Giorgio Bianchin, um, Giorgio um, and um, we estimated the divergence times between uh, the melanobacteria and cyanobacteria and so the data that we get after running the molecular clock and we get that you know we have anarchia sort of split uh, for these two different lineages. Now when it comes to the crown group of cyanobacteria um, um, this is a paper that I published in 2015. It has about 131, 33 genomes. Um, and what we get, these are the sort of early diverging uh, groups. So or what people with traditional call primitive or early branching. Um, all of these uh, species are unicellular, right? Um, and then we also sort of wanted to see the age of the whole group. And, the, you know, indicated with the arrow uh, and again you know this is sort of something in the in the order of three billion um, oh, and I should sort of you know point out here we have the great oxygenation event and the neoproterozoic um, oxygenation event uh, so so this is the crown group cyanobacteria now uh, shortly after the origin of um, this crown group, we have filamentous forms. And, and these filamentous forms likely evolve around the great oxygenation event. Um, so uh, another thing that is interesting that happened here is we get that um, there are two main radiations um, in this paper, I call them the macrocyanobacteria the microcyanobacteria um, and the macrocyanobacteria have you know big cell diameters from sort of three up to 50 microns so really huge cells um, in here we have um, sort of well-known groups like microcystis, trichodesmium, um, sort of the, the, the traditional sort of microbial marine mats are all here um, and in this microcyanobacteria um, micro group, we have um, small cell diameter things like Cinecococcus and Procolococcus. So, um, so those are two important groups. The divergence of the macro and microcyanobacteria again sort of coincide with the great oxygenation event. And my interpretation of this is that something is really going on with the morphology and the ecology, and these, you know, these organisms are starting to um, radiate into sort of different habitats um, that go from land uh, to marine environments. Uh, but mostly there will be benthic um, and mostly sort of microbial mats. Um, this is getting a really, uh, you know, a bit old now, but about sort of, you know, in, in 2010 with Karine Blank, we published um, one of the, you know, first phylogenomic studies um, that in, had also trade evolution, and we postulated that cyanobacteria first evolved in freshwater terrestrial environments, or in other words, low salinity environments, and then they radiated into marine environments later on. Um, this is something that we know we are currently revisiting and, and looking at it from different angles. Uh, but what you get is that the earlier lineages or the most sort of ancestral primitive lineages, um, these are all being 
isolated from sort of so low salinity environments. Now, uh, one of the sort of things that we are um, studying and we are sort of looking at this question from a different angle is looking at the salt tolerant genes. Um, it turns out that um, cyanobacteria can regular osmotic pressure um, things to compatible solutes such as the glucoglycerol, glucoglycate and glycine betaine. These are characteristic of marine species or hypersaline species. Um, and, you know, watch this space. Uh, we're going to, you know, we, we actually asking this question of the origin and the habitat of origin. Now, not only looking at, you know, habitat as a trait, but now we're looking at soil tolerance, but, you know, focus on, on the appearance of these compatible solutes. Um, but, you know, what I can sort of briefly tell you is that these compatible solutes, you know, can be, you know, are close to the root, which then really is telling me that once cyanobacteria evolve, you know, they started really radiating into lots of different habitats. Now, this is, you know, a cartoon that I sort of summarize. It's just easier to see than the, the phylogenetic trees. I'm not talking about this today, but, you know, something, a distinction that I would like to make is oxygenic photosynthesis as a metabolism. And then we have cyanobacteria as the organisms that have left descendants for which we only, you know, we have genomes today. Now, it's likely that these, you know, PS2 and PS1 um, evolve much earlier in organisms that have already gone extinct and that our cyanobacteria, um, you know, sort of probably evolved more on, you know, the end of the Archean. So these, these are the, um, that have left descendants. So by the time we get to the great oxygenation event, um, we have sort of highly sophisticated organisms. Um, and to summarize, they were unicellular. We have filamentous forms early on we have sort of major radiation, see macro and micro cyanobacteria. And most of the diversity that we have today really evolve after the gray oxygenation event during the Proterozoic. So this is really, you know, the time when they became really diverse. This is consistent with the fossil record as well. So, so this is, you know, it, it, it's really it's nice to sort of see um, the different types of evidence um, being consistent with each other. Just to sort of summarize, you know, during this time period, what we have is sort of microbial mats, um, we have these filamentous forms enabling um, the formation of microbial mats, and that would have sort of been, you know, quite predominant uh, during this time period here in the Proterozoic. Now, to sort of highlight what's going on around the great oxygenation event, um, and is that we have that these early oxygenic phototrophs, you know, likely evolve in, in freshwater environments and then move into marine environments. But, you know, again, we have irradiation in, into all sorts of, you know, land um, and, and so on. Um, also, these early organisms, they probably likely needed, you know, adaptation to high UV. And in fact, some, you know, cyanobacteria have sunscreen pigments. Um, they um, also, by the time they get to the, the great oxygenation event, they, you know, transform the chemistry of the earth. Um, but something I want to highlight here is that will we have oxygen, oxygen levels were still very low. Um, and um, it's likely that the ocean wasn't sort of widely productive. This comes later. Now, this takes me to, um, you know, so we have here this sort of benthic world, if you like, with low primary productivity in the oceans. Um, and when it, we get to the end of the Precambrian, uh, we have, um, you know, that is something interesting, and those are planktonic species. Now, if we look into these oceans, 
um, and we think about planktonic cyanobacteria groups, there are really not that many groups that are planktonic. Um, and I'll, I'm going to highlight them here. When it comes to nitrogen fixers, we have uh, things like tricholesmium. Um, they, are, they play a fundamental role in the nitrogen cycle. In fact, they're the ones that are the most significant when it comes to nitrogen fixation. Another group and is highlighted here. This is a, a genome tree. You know, we have just, just one lineage here by Trichodesmion. Another important group are the Cocosphera and Cyanothesi relatives, um, highlighted here in purple. And they are sort of very significant in today's oceans. Now, another important group of primary producers are the uh, Cinecococcus and Procolococcus group. These are more sort of taxonomically diverse. Also, uh, what we get is that Procolococcus um, is being quoted as the most abundant photosynthetic organism on Earth. So you can imagine that, you know, when these groups first evolved, they would have had a major impact on primary productivity. So that was one of the things that um, I wanted to ask when I was um, during, during the fellowship that I've sort of been doing in the last few years. And I wanted to date um, using molecular clock techniques when um, the trichodesmian group appear, so here, and then you know, the sign of, oh, this is Richella, this is another group, but they evolve much later in the Cretaceous, so ignore that, please. Um, and then we have this sort of, the, these unicellular nitrogen fixers, as well as my Cinecococcus and Procolococcus group, which is highlighted here. So all of the sort of major um, sort of planktonic groups are highlighted in blue, and, and you know, I wanted to know how old they are. So this is something we published in Current Biology in 2014, um, and it was a really, you know, I was, it was a really exciting study because it showed that these planktonic groups evolve at the end of the Precambrian, and, and this is the first time uh, that somebody was showing this. Um, and to our surprise, um, we get that the nitrogen fixers evolve first. So that implies that these organisms were almost fertilizing the oceans with nitrogen, which would have allowed other organisms to come and colonize. So this is, we have then sort of Cinecococcus and Prolococcus appearing. Um, but if we look at the geological record, so here we have the geological record of molybdenum, and, and molybdenum um, is important because it tells you something about how well oxygenated the oceans were because it's only, well, only soluble in oxygenated waters. Uh, and interestingly, we have here sort of planktonic groups appearing and, you know, oxygenated waters. So it's, you know, this is just sort of the beginning of a lot of really interesting sort of research ideas. So to summarize, um, we have, you know, this, this sort of benthic world um, in the Precambrian, and then we have, it, you know, the beginning of our planktonic world at the end of the Precambrian. Um, the most recent here, just to highlight some of the most recent molecular clock analysis that we've done for the Cinecococcus and Procolococcus groups, you know, and we have the Neoproterozoic event here. Now, something that, you know, I was talking about cyanobacteria fundamentally transforming the biology. And I was, I think I was referring to the fact that they are so good at establishing uh, symbiotic relationships with other organisms. And one of the most sort of fundamental and probably, but you know, fundamental biological events that ha has happened in our, in our planet is the origin of the chloroplast. Um, so here highlighted, you know, with sort of uh, different groups. Um, and most, you know, relatively recently, Ponce Toledo um, sort of discovered the closest relative to photosynthetic eukaryotes or the, the chloroplast. 
um, and this is Gloe Margarita, um, which has been isolated uh, from a lake in Mexico. So that endosymbiotic event and that ended up giving origin to red algae, glycophytes, green algae, and plants. Um, there is a second um, sort of first endosymbiotic event that gave origin to Bolinella. These organisms are related to the Synecococcus Procolococcus group, but really this, this event was probably the most important. Um, I estimated when uh, these photosynthetic organisms diverged from um, their, clo their Chloe Margarita relative that, you know, if you believe my, my molecular clock analysis that happened after the gray oxygenation event at around 2.1 billion and the photosynthetic group, photosynthetic eukaryotes group um, it's likely to be around the 1.9 billion. And interestingly, there is a lag um, from the, this, the, the, the origin of the crown group. And then we have, you know, at the end of the Precambrian, um, the origin of these sort of three major groups, the streptophytes, the chlorophytes, and the rhodophytes. And I want to point out something really exciting and is that you know the first marine green algae um, evolve you know at the end of the Precambrian again so something is you know is is really happening at the end of the Precambrian um, and we have now so a photosynthetic eukaryotic group evolving around this time so to, to summarize here we have these prasinophytes unicellular green algae um, evolving at the end of the Precambrian. And again, these, these are sort of the Palmophilophysi. Um, they are marine and they're basal to that group. Uh, so these are sort of some of the first uh, green algae appearing here. Now, these molecular clock analyses are consistent uh, with biomarkers. Um, this is data by Johan Brooks um, and is a paper in Nature. Um, and what we, what he found, so here we have the major glaciation events at the end of the Precambrian, um, and what he shows is that there is this sudden diversity of biomarkers for green algae, um, and what this implies is we have these sort of planktonic groups appearing uh, at this time. Um, so, to summarize, um, we have that um, at the end of the Precambrian, we have you know, increased primary productivity that has been the result of nitrogen fixers um, that are cyanobacteria, things like trichodes, mium, the cyanothesi, cocosphera relatives. Um, and the, they would have, so the nitrogen fix, you know, this event likely contributed to the major climatic events that we see around this time because um, I forgot to mention that around this time we have um, the snowball earth, huge climatic events. Um, you can imagine that this increased primary productivity would have, you know, make the biological pump stronger. Um, and they, at this time, um, cyanobacteria transform the nitrogen, the carbon, and the oxygen cycle. Um, the nitrogen by, you know, this, this nitrogen fixes would have drawn quite a lot of nitrogen that, you know, was needed for, you know, making, making proteins. Um, the organic carbon would have served as food, um, and obviously this would have also contributed to the climatic event. So also we have our sort of green algae appearing around this time. So it's, 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 this is a sort of really exciting um, sort of finding. Um, and then if you sort of look at the fossil record of other organisms, the Ediacaran flora, you know, evolving between the 600, 500 million years ago, this is sort of the first go, you know, of sort of multicellularity um, but at this time, you know, we have all the planktonic groups appearing in, and obviously that kind of led to the origin of animals, 
um, at around the 500. So, so, um, but it's really the planktonic groups that would have contributed to this changing in the biochemical cycles and also the origin of our modern Earth system. So to sort of summarize what's happening really around this neoproteozoic oxygenation event, uh, we have these marine planktonic groups diverging from freshwater relatives and marine benthic groups um, that were sort of hanging around in the coast. Um, and then these planktonic groups likely, you know, might had a, a likely sort of major impact on as I said, the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cycles, and is really at the end of the Precambrian during Cryogene that we have that the oceans uh, were probably widely productive, um, and that's um, the you know the end of sort of this um, sort of time period that lasted for, you know quite a long time, um, and I just sort of you know want to at the end um, just sort of thank my, my funders and colleagues. Um, and yeah, so I look forward to um, all the questions that hopefully we're gonna have. So yeah, thank you for listening.